good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Maxwell Maher, and uh, on behalf of the Centre for Law and Society in a Global Context, can I welcome you all very warmly to this annual lecture. Louder, very well. Um, so, um, some of you may remember that uh, this was in, is in fact our 2017-18 annual lecture. Um, we had postponed it um, last year as a result of the strikes, and I wanted to thank our speaker, Professor Talik, for respecting our decision to uh, to postpone, for being willing to reschedule and uh, to come at another time. Uh, this does mean that we're in the fortunate position of having two annual lectures this year, uh, and uh, so uh, um, we're going to be welcoming Jennifer Pitts uh, in uh, January for our, for our second annual lecture uh, this year as it were, so there's lots to look forward to. Um, I believe this is Professor Sully's first visit to Queen Mary, um, but Perhaps it's fair to say that there's a bit of a flicker of homecoming because one of our colleagues here at Queen Mary, Professor Quentin Skinner, who's um, Professor Tully's PhD supervisor, and Professor Skinner is with us um, uh, today. Um, and we hope this visit for, um, is impetus for Queen Mary being more than just a flicker of a home, perhaps more of a home, uh, and if we're ever so lucky for future visits, um, to, to be a real home for, uh, uh, for Professor Tully. Um, this would be all the more wonderful because there's so many overlaps between the research interests uh, and research contributions that Professor Tully has made uh, and uh, the, those of the Center for Law and Society in the Global Context. I just mentioned some of those uh, by way of introduction. Uh, one of them is the history of political and legal thought. And um, in Professor Tully's case, this, this includes uh, the substantive work that he's done uh, in the early work. 17th and 18th century uh, on, on Locke, Offendorf, and Hobbes, um, as well as the uh, uh, methodologically uh, oriented work where he has, over many decades, uh, spoken of the uh, vital, critical role of history for a critical engagement with the present. Uh, he's done that in many different uh, uh, publications. Uh, one that I would highlight is his two volume work, Public Philosophy and a New Key, which I myself read uh, when it came out, as soon as it came out in 2008, and I remember it had a great and transformative effect on me, uh, not just academically, but, but I think perhaps even more so uh, personally, in terms of what it might mean to be a critical and reflective citizen today. Um, and, and it's rare that we have an opportunity to give public thanks to an author from a grateful and admiring reader, so, so I do that. Um, another overlap between our interest in the centre and Professor Sully's work is uh, some knotty issues surrounding the relations between diversity, cultural, religious and otherwise, and constitutionalism. Uh, and here, uh, Professor Tully has contributed to that work in many different ways, including uh, his work with the Canadian Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples in the 1990s, um, as well as his highly influential book, Strange Multiplicity, Constitutionalism in an Age of Diversity, in 1995. Um, and much more has followed since then on uh, many topics, including uh, democracy, recognition, reconciliation, dialogue, civic citizenship, civic freedom, uh, sustainability, ecology, and uh, Violence, which, which we'll be hearing about more uh, today. Um, I think Professor Tully is not just a brilliant scholar, but a very inspirational one. Um, and I say that um, partly because what I find when reading his work is that for all the critical work that he does, uh, there's an enormous amount of optimism, uh, if I may put it that way, in his work. Um, there's a lot of hope. Uh, one might call it, mayhaps, an attitude of critical hope. Uh, and I find it infectious when I read him. Uh, I, I, I'm sure some of you do as well, and uh, I know many people do. Um, I've, I've barely scratched the surface, though. I haven't mentioned any of the prizes and uh, <laughs> many other um, accomplishments, uh, but you've not come here to hear me. Uh, let me just add that he visits us from the University of Victoria, where he is Emeritus Professor of Political Science and Law, and uh, may I now uh, uh, invite him to yeah, give our 
great honor and a great pleasure to be here and give this annual lecture. And uh, I'd like to just acknowledge, as Max already did, Quentin Skinner and Susan James in the audience, who, from whom I've learned so much over the years. So I'm going to be talking about a certain kind of nonviolence, integral nonviolence, in this lecture. And it is a formal lecture, and I'll, I'll read the lecture uh, as quickly as I can, and then I hope we have time, a uh, fairly substantial time, for Q&A. it's appropriate that I'm giving this lecture on nonviolence today. As you know, on October the 2nd is the annual recognition of Gandhi as a major influence at the UN, and it's the date of nonviolence, annual day of nonviolence, has been since 2007, since the 150th uh, anniversary of Gandhi's uh, birth. And this is uh, the integral nonviolence I'm talking about, derives from the Gandhian tradition and uh, how we might think about it today. So here's how it goes. And the word integral in, with nonviolence is, in fact, a word that Gandhi himself used in 1946. So throughout the last century, we've witnessed increasing violence, domination, and exploitation, both among humans and against the living earth. The great, this great transformation and acceleration has led to horrendous inequalities, social dislocation, and enmity in the <coughs> in human societies and to climate change, a sixth mass extinction, and ecosphere degradation. These interconnected eco-social eco cycles are vicious. They feed on each other and threaten to render life unsustainable for most homo sapiens and millions of other species. One response to this complex crisis has been the revival of interest in nonviolence in practice and in academic research. In its most ambitious form, the hypothesis is that relationships of violence and domination are at the root of the crisis of social and ecological unsustainability. If this is the case, then the cultivation of relations of nonviolence and non-domination with each other in the living earth is the way to remediate and sustain the damaged social and ecological conditions of cooperation and contestation that sustain all forms of life on earth. To borrow Carl Polanyi's famous phrase in the 1940s, the project is to transform and re-embed violent and dominative human relations into non-violent and non-dominative sustainable eco-social relationships, systems, and virtuous cycles, and to do this by non-violent means. The problem this uh, project faces is that the most prominent tradition of non-violence today was not designed for such a task. After the assassination of Martin Luther King, a pragmatic or instrumental form of nonviolence as unarmed resistance became paramount. On this view, nonviolence is just seen as an effective set of instruments or techniques to change legislation, overthrow rulers, and uh, gain power. So my aim in this lecture is to achieve another and much broader tradition of nonviolence, and this is the nonviolence of Gandhi, of Richard King, and of Martin Luther King Jr. On their view, nonviolence is not a technique to gain power over others, but an integrated way of life based on the exercise of another type of power altogether, power with and for each other and the living earth. This tradition is designed to transform gradually the violence, domination, and unsustainable development of modern industrial civilization into nonviolent and sustainable counter-modernity. Here's how Richard Gregg put it in 1952. This is the quote. War is an inherent, inevitable, and essential element of the civilization in which we live. Our aim can be nothing short of building an entirely new civilization in which domination and violence of all kinds play a small and steadily decreasing part. We must change non-violently and deeply the motives, the functions, and the institutions of our whole culture. End quote. So hundreds of millions of people continue to practice this kind of non-violence today, often called everyday Gandhians. But it's dispersed and it's, in, it's kind of disintegrated, not in, not in the integrated way that Gandhi, Greg, and King argue is essential to its long-term success as a slow but sure process of transformation and transformative social change. So the task today is a kind of reintegration of this 
disintegrated communities of practice of nonviolence we see around the world. So everyone knows about uh, Gandhi and King, but Richard Gregg is not uh, known as well. So I'll just say a few words about Richard uh, Gregg before I start. So Gregg lived from 1885 to 1974. Like Gandhi, he was a lawyer. He graduated from Harvard Law in 1911. He practiced law at the National Board Labor Board uh, during the war and law firms in Boston and Chicago during the great labor capital conflicts of 1919 to 1922, including the railroad union strike, and he was a lawyer for the railroad, one of the biggest strikes in U.S. history. He soon came, dis by the early 1920s, he became disillusioned with the power of capital over labor, with the violence of mo modes of conflict resolution, <clears throat> and with the future of capital, potential of capitalism, and also the repression of the labor movement after the failure of the strikes in 1922. So Greg came across Gandhi's writings in 1922-23 and decided to move to India and learn of what Gandhi was up to. He lived and worked with Gandhi in his Sabarmati uh, ashram from 1925 to 1929. They became very close friends. Under Gandhi's guidance, Greg taught Gandhian economics and village-based self-government in different parts of India. He returned to the U.S. in 1930, but he and Gandhi continued to correspond with each other until 1947. Greg returned to India during the Salt March and again a couple of times after Gandhi's death. Greg dedicated himself to explaining Gandhian nonviolence as an integrated way of life to Westerners in over 10 books and many articles. His book, The Power of Nonviolence, became the leading text of the nonviolent movements here in the UK, in Europe, and in North America from about 1934 to the mid-1960s. <clears throat> Martin Luther King read Greg's book for the first time in 1956, and it soon became the manual of nonviolent resistance for the African and American movement and the civil rights movement. <clears throat> King and Greg met then in 1958, corresponded, lectured together across the South. King wrote the preface to the 1959 edition of Greg's Power of Nonviolence. In addition to these activities, Greg also participated in sustainable farming communities in Vermont and New York. He wrote several books on the superiority of Gandhian cooperative and village-based economics to large-scale capitalism, socialism, and communism. These books, in turn, had a, had a huge influence on E.F. Schumacher and on the alternative economics movement in India and in North America. So he became a well-known figure by the time, by the mid-60s. So, for Gandhi and Greg, if I can now begin to explain this, are we going to put up the, the one-page summary? I just want to put up a kind of skeleton of the structure of argument of the integrated way of life. And that's, I'll just be explicating it as I go along. And you, it's more or less follows this outline. Okay. So for Gandhi and Greg, nonviolence is a, what we might call multifaceted alternative way of life or civilization, which is composed of many interdependent branches analogous to a banyan tree. Gandhi's analogy. The power of nonviolence, the word satyagraha, is a persuasive kind of power that comes into being when people exercise power with and for each other and without coercion or submission. It is the power with, as it's termed, that animates all branches of a nonviolent way of life and brings a new civilization into being. Power with is used in systems of cooperation and in nonviolent forms contestation, social change, and conflict resolution with nonviolent and violent opponents. It's an effective substitute for war, for violent revolution, and domination as the means of conflict and conflict resolution. In learning how to connect with, to trust, to exercise, and eventually to be empowered by this form of power, humans participate in what Greg calls spiritual unity, or the anima mundi, that's to say, more general form of symbiosis that animates and sustains all life on Earth. In contrast, violence and domination are the type of power exercised in violent conflicts and unequal relations of domination and subordination 
that are imposed or backed up by force or the threat of force, and the various types of legitimation. It is power over in its many forms. It's based on the false presupposition that humans are basically independent, insecure, and incapable of organization and dispute resolution without the exercise of violence and domination by a ruler. The violence and domination and the exploitation that they enable give rise to increasing cycles of violent resistance, counter-violence, and domination. These cycles are justified by the assumption that violent and dominating methods bring about peaceful and non-dominating ends. But this is a false view of the relationship between means and ends. The vicious cycles continue because means are autotelic. Here's how Greg puts it. Whether we're considering the life of an individual or of a society, that life is a process, a series of successive stages or steps. The character of each stage forms the basis for the character of the following stage. So the character of the means qualifies and determines the end." end quote. So nonviolent cooperation and contestation is the only way to a peaceful and democratic world, that is, by being the change. Many forms of violent and nonviolent power relations, of course, exist in every society and crisscross in complex ways. Violent power over is an inherent element in almost every branch of modern civilization, shaping the motives, function, and institutions, as well as the values, assumptions, and forms of subjectivity of moderns. From within the prevailing mindset, nonviolent power is overlooked or is perceived as subordinate and ridiculed as the soft power of the weak. Moderns have a kind of disintegrated form of subjectivity, power over in some spheres, power with in others. It becomes difficult to see that the overlooked and, mis overlooked and misrepresented social and biological relationships of being with, power with, and cooperating with are actually the background conditions that sustain all forms of life, and that the civilization in which we live parasitically depends on them and destroys them, degrades them. Thus, to see the human condition from the nonviolent perspective and to test its validity, it's necessary to move around and to begin participating and experimenting in nonviolent, constructive and agonistic ways of living and the corresponding ways of knowing that the participation discloses to the participants. So that's what I'm going to try and just sketch out now. Greg and Gandhi, again, there are four main features of the Banyan tree of nonviolence. The first is the power of nonviolence itself that animates all the branches of power with. Secondly, the nonviolent ethics that make up the trunk of the tree. Thirdly, what are called constructive programs that are the main branches. And four, the whole area of nonviolent contestation and conflict resolution vis a vis violent opponents. The parent trunk of this banyan tree of nonviolence is nonviolent ethics, and these are manifest in the ethos of a nonviolent actor. It's the actualization of the power of nonviolence in human life. Gandhi refers to it as swaraj, self-government, in its primary sense. That's to say, the government of the conduct of oneself by oneself in all relationships with others in all branches of life. Next, Swaraj has a second meaning, again, self-government, but here in the second sense, it's the really the, a central branch. This is participation in constructive programs. These are programs of collective self-government in nonviolent communities of participatory democracy and nonviolent dispute resolution. Democratic Swaraj begins in everyday activities, in ashrams, in cooperatives, in community-based organizations, and in villages. Then it scales out in concentric circles or networks of delegated representation to global federalism from below, integrated or perna swaraj. Participatory democracy is simply the people exercising the power of nonviolence together. These forms of local self-government in communities of various scales are also economically self-reliant. Sustainable economic self-reliance, in turn, is dependent on regenerative or cyclical resource use, 
human scale, green technology, handicraft, and waste recycling. The ethical and legal norm of these communities is sarvodaya, and this is again a Gandhian word meaning working and governing with each other and for the health and well-being of each other, their communities, and the ecosystems on which they depend. Another complementary branch is public education integrated with the branches it studies and for which it prepares its students. <clears throat> the branch immediately available to everyone, here and now, so to speak, is to live lives of nonviolent, voluntary simplicity in appropriate ways in the relationships one inhabits in modern civilization, here and now. These branches comprise the basic constructive program of a nonviolent civilization. The Greg himself lived and worked and taught in nonviolent communities of practice in India and in the US. His famous pamphlet, The Value of Voluntary Simplicity, which introduced that term, uh, 1935, presents the health, the well-being, the moral intellect, <coughs> excuse me, moral, intellectual, and spiritual benefits of nonviolent ways of life in contrast to the lives of competitive display and consumption that modern industrial civilization promotes and depends on for its wasteful and destructive linear development. Finally, citizens of constructive programs work with citizens reforming modern institutions from within and other social movements for change. So what are the values that are generated in living within constructive programs or a life of voluntary simplicity? First, particip participants in agriculture and handicrafts connect with the ecological relationships and cycles that sustain the renewable resources on which humans depend. They learn to, learn to work and live in accord with their cyclical and regenerative slow temporality, again in contrast to lin linear and extractive, unsustainable, fast temporality of modern civilization. They become aware of their basic interdependency with other forms of life, what the Gandhi and Arne Nass called our ecological self, rather than the priority of an independent or autonomous self of modernity. They see themselves as citizens of their bioregions in the first instance. Secondly, their handicrafts, their human scale technology, and their ecological economics create a technosphere that respects and learns from the ecosphere on which it depends, now called biomimicry in North America. Thirdly, in exercising nonviolent powers of self-government with and for each other in their everyday activities, they develop the virtues of democratic citizenship. They learn the skills of nonviolent communication, contestation, and conflict resolution with partners of different genders, religion, races, and languages, as in Gandhi's ashrams. Fourth, constructive programs are activi activities of non-cooperation with the dominant institution and the institutions of modern society and the cooperative exercise of human capabilities in constructing non-violent alternative institutions. This is the so-called double movement, which quietly weakens the dominant institutions and shows that another civilization is not only possible, but also actual constructive programs manifest a better way of life for all to see. That's important because people are unlikely to be persuaded to contest an, un an unjust social system on which they depend if there isn't a viable alternative available. Fifth and finally, constructive programs provide a solution to one of the central problems of nonviolent campaigns tendency of campaigners to lose their self-discipline, to turn to anger and animosity, and to gauge, engage in violence, or flee, or submit. Participation addresses this problem directly by cultivating an ethos of nonviolent self-discipline and concern for others that has the capacity to ground resolute and effective nonviolent agonistics and civil defense. Greg presented this argument in a little book called Discipline for Nonviolence in 1941, and Gandhi wrote a very famous preface to it. So participating in constructive programs then cultivates a fourfold nonviolent ethos of the physical body, of our emotions, of our mind, of reason, 
and of our spirit working together. It consists of the nonviolent virtues of courage, of endurance, of patience, of self-reliance, and mutual reliance, love of truth, and the creative energy needed to sustain nonviolence in the face of violence and gain the respect and trust of violent <coughs> opponents. All these activities together, Greg concludes, provide a greater variety, engage a wider range of human faculties and potentialities, reach a deeper and loftier level of being, and are more mutually consistent than our military exercises and military discipline." End quote. So constructive programs then are the necessary support system of nonviolent contestation and campaigns. In contrast, violence and domination as the means of conflict and resolution are supported by very large scale power over private and public institutions and an ethos of aggressive self-interested competition among individuals, groups, corporations, states, empires, and military industrial complexes. These global systems are claimed to be the way to world peace. Nonviolent proponents reply, but because the means prefigure the ends, these systems lead to more violence and domination. Cooperative programs and nonviolent contestation, again, is the only means to world peace and democracy. Now, these constructive programs rest in turn on the basic trunk of the Banyan tree, which is this whole body of practice called nonviolent ethics, or just the way, <clears throat> in the various nonviolent traditions. So here we go on the nonviolent ethics. I realize Susan James is in the audience, so I have to be careful how I present the structure of argument here. Uh, but I think uh, I can summarize it fairly well. So nonviolent ethics compri comprise the virtue that virtues that constitute the character formation or the ethos of a free, self-governing human being. A nonviolent ethos realizes, in the late 19th century sense of the word realize, it realizes the persuasive power of nonviolence by becoming aware of it, grasping it, hanging on to it, being moved by and with it, exercising it well in all relationships and circumstances continuously reflecting on its use and misuse, and then beginning again. It is the way humans participate in the personal, social, ecological, and spiritual power or energy that animates all life. And this is what Greg calls spiritual unity. Here's the quote. A person does not create moral power. It comes to her or him only after she or he has complied with certain principles. This compliance enables them to tap the spiritual power pervading the entire world, just as one by a suitable connection and switches can tap an electric current from a power circuit. So this is Greg's translation, if you like, a reformulation of Gandhi's hypothesis of a basic soul power of nonviolence uniting, uniting all life. The nonviolent virtues are the engaged dispositions of the body, the emotion, mind, and spirit integrated into a nonviolent pattern of existence orientation. They are manifest in their characteristic attitude, ways of feeling, thinking, interacting in relationships with oneself and other. They're cultivated and integrated into a settled yet changeable ethos through examples, through meditation, through practice, yoga, discipline, and experimental trial and error, experiments with truth. Ethical self-awareness and self-formation takes place in communities of practice and in practices of the self, as in Gandhi's karma yoga tradition of selfless service with others. Greg learned them in Gandhi's ashram, beginning with morning group meditation on the central virtues in the Gita. The way one works on one's ethical comportment is so closely inter interrelated to one's conduct and one's relationship with and responsiveness to others that a nonviolent ethos brings into being and sustain a nonviolent way of life with those you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. The core nonviolent virtues from which all the others derived are encapsulated in a concept that Gandhi invented, and he called this, this word Satyabhava here, that we're now coming down to number two. Okay. The first part of it 
refers to the virtue of forthright truthfulness and openness, I believe, paresia in Greek. It consists in the continuous search for truth. It involves asserting the truth courageously as one sees it to the powers that be, yet with the awareness that each person's view of the truth is partial, and thus that it's necessary to enter into dialogues with all affected others, to gain a many-sided understanding of the truth in any situation. Thus the soft power way one asserts the truth openly as one sees it, yet with the virtue of epistemic humility, is of utmost importance, as it must bring others around to see that they can trust you, and so enter into a dialogue in which they will be listened to and treated with reciprocal respect. Secondly, the root of satya, truth, is, is S-A-T, which is just being. The ground of our being is the interdependent, life-sustaining relationships of mutual love, with, again, Gandhi's term, ahimsa. Here's how he puts it. If love or nonviolence be not the law of our being, the whole of my argument falls to pieces, and there is no escape from a periodical recurrence of war, each succeeding one outdoing the preceding one in ferocity." End of quote. So the virtue of love, or ahimsa, refers negatively to non-harm of other living beings, and positively to the act of understanding or compassion and cooperation of all living beings, what Eric Fromm called in the 1950s biophilia, and Martha Nussbaum calls generosity and empathy in, in her book, Anger and Forgiveness. It is the virtue appropriate to the belief in the interconnectedness of all forms of life. For Greg, this virtue of love is the origin of all the others, as it is with Martin Luther King. Love involves the very principle and essence of continuity of life itself. It entails respect for all life. Like Kropotkin, he often describes the relations of love as mutual aid or symbiosis. The most important dimension of love in nonviolent contestation is its creative power. King uses the Greek word agape. And um, <coughs> Black Lives Matter do the same today. The persuasive power that can motivate human beings to reflect on and transform their violent and dominative habits into nonviolent ways. Finally, the graha at the end of Satyagraha refers to the virtue of nonviolent courage. It is the courage to grasp firmly and to exercise the power of nonviolence in everything one does, including self suffering, contestation, and helping others in dire need. Whereas soldiers control their fear and are willing to die, they direct their disciplined anger and hatred at the enemy and kill them. Nonviolent actors learn to control fear and anger, yet are willing to suffer and die. Yet they also take the next step in human evolution if the species is to survive. They learn to sublimate their anger into the more powerful emotion and trained disposition of non-harm and compassion for their opponents. So these nonviolent virtues make up what's called an experimental ethos, a life of experiments with truth. Truthfulness, love, and courage are not only autotelic, they orient humans to sustaining their own well-being in ways that co-sustain the well-being of all interdependent others, this concept of Sarvodaya. To discover these ways, they enter into dialogues of mutual learning and cooperation in which each learns how, to, how things appear from the perspective of others. Nonviolent virtues are the virtues of participatory democracy. Their exercise gives rise to a kind of knowing with, through working with each other, constructive programs and in campaigns. Each exercise is a test of one's knowledge of these virtues involved. And by means of many trial, trials and error, participants and researchers slowly build up the arts and sciences of a nonviolent civilization. Okay. The difficulty in this development of nonviolent ethics and passing it on intergenerationally is that the cultivation of nonviolent ethics takes place in a world in which violent ethics is normal in many circumstances. For Gandhi and Greg, violence doesn't begin when people employ weapons. It begins long before in violent dispositions and attitudes. Here's how Gandhi famously put it. <coughs> 
Nonviolence is not only ethically superior to violence, it also can be stronger, but it's often diluted or contaminated by anger or en enmity, and its power is undermined. The word satyagraha is often most, most loosely used and is made to cover veiled violence. But as the author of the word, I may be allowed to say that it excludes every form of violence, direct or indirect, whether in thought, word, or deed. It's a breach of satyagraha to wish ill of an opponent or to say a harsh word to him or of him with the intention of doing harm. And often the evil thought or evil word may be more dangerous than actual violence used in the heat of the moment. Nonviolence is gentle, it never wounds. It must be the result, it, it must not be the result of anger or of malice. It was conceived as a complete substitute for violence. End of that quote, it was in 1919. Gandhi calls these violent dispositions at the heart of, of our violent and dominant society duragraha, D-U-R-A, and then graha. It means that we become propelled by and subject to the charge of our fear, or our anger, or our animosity in response to a disturbance. For the ethical nonviolent tradition, this in initial attitudinal violence is the result of all violence and domination. And this is why nonviolent ethics are absolutely of fundamental importance, just like in certain other traditions like Buddhism and so on. When disputes arrive in everyday interaction, humans usually pause, collect themselves, draw on the background taken for granted intersubjective relationships and resources of trustful nonviolence, discover the source of the difference, work out mutually acceptable modes of conciliation in our family and our day-to-day -day interactions. These are the background being with or social capital <coughs> conditions of social life itself, the socialites. Nonviolent conciliation preserves these life-serving conditions if in contrast, antagonism were the usual response, humans would have perished long ago. With Duragraha, however, individuals and groups allow the emotional propulsion of fear and anger to disconnect them, alienate themselves from, and override the background relationships of mutual trust, to find themselves a separate and evince an aggressive or submissive attitude of distrust towards others. With this often involuntary movement, they move out of the world of power with and into the world of power over. This outwardly directed attitude of distrustful separateness affects relational others, and they tend to respond in kind. The initial attitudinal interactions tend to generate amplifying circular responses of mutual insecurity, ill will, and antagonism as each tries to acquire the means to gain power over others. These competitions give rise to the violent military, political, and economic power over systems and struggles of modernity. And they have blowback effects on all social relations within these societies, as we all know today. These systems appear autonomous to us, but they're really the ongoing consequence of out outwardly directed attitudes of separation, distrust, and insecurity, and the impulse to domination that runs through them. So without training in nonviolent ethics, people who grow up in these social systems acquire the corresponding subject formation. Independence, insecurity, and antagonism now appear to be the ground of being human, the natural condition of humankind. The prior step of alienation from being with relations of interdependence and cooperation is overlooked and forgotten. The only way to peace and security appears to be to impose order and compliance to the institution aggressive competition in modern society. Within this worldview, focus, of course, is on victory over the opponent as success, the long-term destruction, domination, exploitation, and greed of the victors, and the resentment and resistance of the victims are overlooked, yet they lead to further cycles of insecurity and struggle. If they're not transformed, Greg argues, these trends will lead to extermination by war or civilizational collapse by resource depletion. Subjects of these systems are caught up in what Greg nicely calls dual loyalty. On the one hand, they're familiar with the power of nonviolence in everyday life and in their spiritual and humanistic tradition. 
teach them these virtues. On the other, they participate in and depend on dominant power over system and are constrained to set aside nonviolent virtues and act aggressively in order to survive. The result of disintegrated personality of these shifting dual loyalties leads to a kind of pervasive social neurosis that further fuels the competitive cycles for power over. So the primary role, the first role of nonviolent ethics, therefore, is to acquire the, acquire the ability of non-retaliation to pause, resist the emotional charge of Jiragraha, or to transform the violent habitats once it's formed. Like Greek, Christian, and Eastern ethics, the cultivation of this ability of non-retaliation initially involves what are three standard steps of self-transformation, which I'm sure everyone knows. The first consists in becoming aware of the need to free oneself from the disposition to be motivated by fear, anger, and animosity in its undisciplined or in its disciplined forms. This is the step of non-attachment to retaliation and of remaining attached to, or beginning to reattach, to relationships and dispositions of mutual trust, care, and concern. This first step of dawning self-awareness goes along with the second step of beginning to practice the non-violent ethics that bring about the self-transformation of one's habitual dispositions. In Greg's own life, step one was the exercise of unequal capital labor contests in the US his realization of the structural power of capital over labor, and then reading Gandhi. The second step was to move to India and immerse himself in the constructive programs. As they engage in practices of self-transformation and constructive programs and voluntary simplicity, they also acquire the co corresponding form of self-awareness, the underlying spiritual, social, and ecological relationships of nonviolent cooperation come to awareness as they interact in accord with them. This dawning spiritual unity dimension of existence enables them to appraise the values and assumptions of the dominant ethos in contrast and to begin to free themselves from them. At some time in this process of self-transformation, they reconnect with and trust the intersubjective power of nonviolence, and it animates their further efforts. So this is the third step of reconnection, or de-alienation and empowerment with the animacy of life. And in various traditions in the West, it has different names, the rebound, the skuko cults, and so on. Grace in, in the Christian tradition, gift reciprocity in the indigenous world, and so on. Greg himself uses the analogy of learning to swim to elucid elucidate all three steps of this moral conversion to a nonviolent way of life. He says, at first he couldn't believe that the water would buoy him up. He fought against it and he sank. Yet he gradually acquired the ability to swim by learning through practice to become aware of, to trust, and to work with the background power of buoyancy of water, and so acquire the self-awareness, virtues, and self-confidence of a competent swimmer. Analogously, the three transformative ethical steps bring about a moral conversion from an ethos of separation and power over one of interbeing and power with. The cultivation of nonviolent ethos thus, is thus the way humans connect with the power of nonviolence and exercise it in animating all branches of a nonviolent way of life. This self transformation is the way to a nonviolent world, and constructive programs provide the kind of milieu in which people can acquire this uh, form of subject. Okay, so that's all the kind of basis for nonviolent contestation. And now I want to turn and look quickly at what I call uh, nonviolent agonistics or nonviolent campaigns. So nonviolent agonistics is the branch that grows in every other branch of this tree. Disagreements and disputes arise in every human relationship from your most intimate ones global disputes, and these occur even in constructive programs and ashrams. So members learn the arts of nonviolent contestation and resolution with each other, and in response to the impulse to dominate wherever it erupts. They then take this nonviolent savoir-faire, 
knowledge, practical knowledge, into their campaigns with violent actors and observers. And for this tradition, there are two main phases of nonviolent campaigns. The first is to persuade violent contestants, their backers and observers, just to move to a nonviolent way of contestation and resolution. And Greg explicates this complex struggle with this analogy called moral jujitsu, which I'll come back to. In the second phase, contestants enter into nonviolent negotiations and reconciliation. And here he uh, follows Mary Follett Parker, Mary Par Parker Follett. He calls it integration, the term that Martin Luther King picked up. The aim of the nonviolent actors here is to assert to their opponents truthfully and openly the injustice in dispute as they see it, and to persuade violent actors and observers to become aware of the superiority of nonviolent ways of contestation, <coughs> excuse me, to their power over ways, and to join them in resolving their differences nonviolently. Greg calls this process of self-awareness and self-change moral conversion. The way they try to bring it about <coughs> with their violent opponents is by playing a nonviolent game of contestation with them as if they were already nonviolent partners. They exercise the persuasive powers of nonviolent ethics. They courageously refuse to retaliate with anger or, or hatred when attacked or abused. They openly announce their plans and campaigns. They break off, apologize, and make amends whenever their individual swaraj fails them and they become angry and, and animated. They present the truth as they see it from their limited social standpoint listen to the views of all affected, offer to enter into negotiations, always act in trustworthy and humble ways, strive to accept denigration, beatings, imprisonment, torture, and death, with good temper, and all the other modes of nonviolent ethical conduct. They explain why their protests, their sit-ins, their marches, their boycotts, their non-cooperation, their occupations, their strikes, and 191 other types of campaign are not coercive express their willingness to amend them if they are found to be. They treat everyone as moral agents, as ends in themselves, and members of a we, never as enemies, and thus with the inner freedom to engage in ethical self-change, just as they have done already. Their ethical exercise of nonviolence in the democratic way they organize and interact among themselves and engage with their violent contestants enacts and dramatizes the alternative nonviolent way of life for all to see. It's the persuasive assertion of the unity of the human species, Craig writes. The whole event, then, is a public contest between two categorically different forms of contestation and their contrasting life ways. On the one side, the exemplary open exercise and offer of power with. On the other, power over organization, secrecy, the mobilization of violence, domination, usually of deception. Their objectives in this great contest of contests is to encourage all affected to reflect on the two contrasting ways of life on display <coughs> and to work through <coughs> steps of self-transformation and moral conversion towards trusting nonviolence. As differently situated actors and observers begin to reflect on the dramatic context, contest and change, their attitudes to the dispute, their silent or open withdrawal of support, begin slowly to undermine the social basis of support of the violent actors and the social regime that they are defending. So in this contest of contests, nonviolent actors are kind of analogous to exemplary swimming instructors, Greg tells us, showing students how to trust and use the buoyant power of water, and in this case, the buoyant power of nonviolence. And there are several reasons why nonviolent contestation actually works. One is the hypothesis that everyone has, at least in their hearts, a spark of good spirit, which can eventually be aroused and strengthened into action. Nonviolent action can spark this su suggestion that, quote, there's something in the world more powerful and desirable than physical force. This auto-suggestion is the beginning of nonviolent social change. The second reason is that organized violence is often more powerful than violence, while courageous violent actors remain at the level of anger, hatred, and antagonism, courageous nonviolent actors 
enact and dramatize the higher power of uncoerced cooperation with and for fellow contestants. Rather than dissipating power and struggling against each other, they gently try to guide their opponents towards freely combining their energy in uncoerced negotiations. A third reason is that nonviolence tends to surprise and throw violent actors off balance. They, after all, are trained to anticipate to fight with opponents who either fight back or flee or submit. When nonviolent actors refuse to respond in any of these familiar ways and act otherwise, the kind of savoir faire, the skill set of the violent actors doesn't work as expected. They and the regime they uphold tend to lose control of the situation in front of them as they plunge forward as it is, in, in, as it were, into a new world of values. So this unique situation is the emergence of the transformative dynamic that Greg calls a kind of or sort of moral jiu-jitsu that has the capacity to supersede war, violent revolution, and pragmatic civil resistance to Gerdorov, the three dominant yet destructive themes of social change for centuries. So a little bit about this famous concept of Greg's called moral jiu-jitsu. You probably all know Joan Bondurant. Western uh, attempt to translate this transformative potential of nonviolence into what she called a dialectic and compared it with what's available in the Western tradition at Princeton. And then it was republished in the 1990s for a new generation of nonviolent actors in uh, Black Lives Matter and Me Too and so on. I don't know more. Okay, so here's how it goes Greg constructed his metaphor of moral jiu jitsu here in the 20s translate specific dynamic features of this immensely creative power of Satyagraha because the art of physical jiu-jitsu was actually familiar to audiences in India, the colonized world, and in the West. Jiu-jitsu in the 20s was seen as the appropriate means of engagement in two types of struggles, in decolonization struggles and in feminist movements against male power. Rather than mimicking the violent ways of Western colonization and patriarchy, anti-colonial revolutionaries and feminists would engage instead in jiu-jitsu movements, causing their opponents to, and here's suffragette movements here in England, causing their opponents to lose their balance and plunge into unfamiliar non-violent ways, enabling them to gain a stronger position. Greg realized that the specific features of the general dynamic in jiu-jitsu are somewhat analogous to the similar features in the transformative dynamic of nonviolence in this moral and self, uh, psychological realm. So Greg compares and contrasts the dynamic features of physical jiu-jitsu and moral jiu-jitsu in the following ways. And here's just a brief summary of how things at work. First, the, one, the violent aggressor begins by assuming the superiority of the power of violence. The moral jiu-jitsu practitioners surprise the aggressor by refusing to retaliate. They non-retaliate by the exercise of non-violent ethics and goodwill in campaigns. The aggressor loses the moral and psychic support that predictable violent resistance normally provides. The non-violent actors use the virtues of kindness, generosity, and self-suffering to pull violent opponents along. The attackers lose their balance and their skill set becomes ineffective, whereas the non-violent actors retain their balance and their equilibrium. In the course of interactions between violent action and moral jiu-jitsu, the violent actor and observers come to realize that the non-violent contestant has a stronger character formation, position, and form of power than violence. Over time, the prevailing assumption and attitude that violence is strong and love is weak is reversed in practice for all to see. Finally, the moral jiu-jitsu master doesn't use their superior power to throw their opponent, opponent and gain power over them, as in physical jiu-jitsu. Rather, the moral jiu-jitsu contestant knows better and offers a helping hand. So the contest continues until the violent actor and observer are persuaded of the superiority of nonviolence and agree to convert to its use in resolving the conflict. Since winning a struggle, transforming an oppressive social system, and securing genuine and lasting peace really does require 
winning over the morale, the hearts and minds of all affected, as Koska has put it, this autotelic method is really the only effective long-term means of peace. As they're engaging in campaign maneuvers and counter-maneuvers, nonviolent actors also engage in public dialogues, presenting their arguments, asking others to present theirs, and offering to enter into negotiations. They don't attack, dismiss, or destroy opposing groups, rather they engage in nonviolent ways of arguing with their dialogue partners. They examine the components of their arguments to find values and assumptions they agree with. Then they examine the value and the assumptions they disagree with, give their reasons, present their alternatives, acknowledge their perspectival character, and request constructive responses. This way of reasoning with, as Tony Layton calls it, ensures that each person's point of view needs, <clears throat> view needs and new ideas are taken seriously. Without this dialogue, any so-called resolution is just another power over the structure of domination. The self-suffering of nonviolent campaigners shows their sin sincerity and their deep convictions. This resolute commit commitment to a nonviolent way of life, come what may, elicits a certain kind of admiration and even awe. It moves violent actors and onlookers to re reflect more deeply on the two contrasted ways of life being performed. If nonviolent ethics were absent, as in unarmed resistance or Duracraw, resistors mobilize ill will and animosity and engage in strategies to gain power over violent opponents, then both contestants are playing the same power over, over game. It's just war by other means. Because there's no know here no contrast between violent and nonviolent ways of life to reflect on, there's no possibility of transforming the power over system, both contestants accept them. Whereas in Gandhian uh, agonistics, the comparative contrast between the two ways of life being enacted becomes increasingly clearer, deeper, and potentially transformative over time. Okay. So here's the key difficulty as this tradition sees it in moving moderns to take seriously these kinds of reasons I've presented here, very poorly, I'm sure. Uh, <clears throat> and here, uh, here's, the, here's the central problem the, this nonviolent tradition sees in getting people even to consider these, and it's not easy. And it's this basic presupposition that these systems that we inhabit and form our subjectivity are the necessary means to peace, to cooperation, to security, to development, and so on. The soft power of moral jujitsu is meant to expose the falsity of this position. The presumption, the presumptive ne necessity of power over, rests on what's called the rabble hypothesis, that humans are incapable of settling disputes and cooperating without the coercive imposition of power over. The moral jujitsu campaigns and the constructive programs demonstrate that this is empirically false. Observers see ordinary humans engaged fairly consistently in nonviolent cooperation and contestation in all their activities, resolutely hanging on to it, face the violence, giving their explanations of it, and offering it to others. This resonates with the observer's background spark and experience of nonviolence and calls into question the need for the dual loyalty of modern subjects. Power over is also claimed to be the necessary means to peace, security, and cooperation in the future. When observers turn and examine their own societies in contrast, they see that the exercise of violent means undermines the ends that are used to justify it. Domination doesn't lead to democratic cooperation, but to coercive compliance and resistance in the competitive economic institutions of modern civilization. Hier hierarchically organized violence and inequality in wars and revolution and repression and dissent doesn't appear to lead to peace and security, but to increasingly destructive cycles of violent struggles and insecurity. The dominant responses of this performative contradiction are justification, justifications in terms of a faith in progress always to come, famous phrase, by means of more overpowering war and domination and the excuse that there, that there isn't an alternative. For Greg and his generation of peace activists, this security dilemma 
is the fatal flaw in the global system of armed states and all power over systems within them. The dilemma is that the means employed to resolve the initial insecurity and distrust reproduces them. In the course of moral jujitsu com campaigns, the futility of violence and domination and their justifying assumptions come into the space of questions and are exposed. And the nonviolent alternative is enacted for all to see and to share. Greg agrees that the insecurity and distrust does underlie the fear, anger, and antagonism that initiates the security dilemma. Yet unlike most modern theorists, he doesn't take this as given as the initial condition. Rather, he argues that insecurity and, and distrust are brought into being by the initial step of separation and alienation from the given background intersubjective relationships of mutual trust and security. The objective of moral jiu-jitsu is to bring to consciousness this whole background that's overlooked in the modern worldview. Nonviolent actors then present the nonviolent way to dissolve the security dilemma. And here's what it is. When violent actors and the power that be lose their equilibrium as their local and global support declines, nonviolent actors refuse to throw their opponents, as is done in physical jiu-jitsu, in bargaining, in revolution, and in war. Instead, they offer the gift of an open and sincere helping hand to create together a new game of moral equilibrium in nonviolent relationships of integration. This helping hand step is a radical offer of trust and security, backed up by the whole trustworthy pattern of conduct that pr precedes and supports it, because the way to generate trust in conditions of distrust is by being trustworthy and trusting, trusting despite the vulnerability that it entails. It can change the whole dynamics of circular responses between violent and nonviolent actors. To accept this offer, perhaps only tentatively at first, is the initial step of self-transformation and of moral conversion. Barbara Deeming, a very famous uh, in the States, feminist theorist and practitioner of nonviolence, argues that the moral jiu-jitsu double movement of asserting the truth on the one hand to the powerful offering this open helping hand combines the masculine and feminine characteristics into a new androgynous synthesis. The very, she says, the very genius of nonviolence, in fact, is that it demonstrates them to be indivisible and so, so restores human community, end of quote. Influential in the uh, Black Lives Matter The aim of joining hands, then, is to convert the opponent to change their understanding and sense of values so they'll join wholeheartedly in seeking settlements that are amicable and satisfying to both sides. It helps to reestablish the violent attacker's moral bal balance, but at a higher and more secure level. The crucial point here is that no, no conflict can be solved at the level of the conflict itself. Contestants have to move themselves into nonviolent relations of cooperation and contestation. This is the only way consistent with human freedom. So the cumulative effects of all interactions in the complex field of circular responses gradually move the participants to accept the offer of negotiations and to enter into negotiations for transformative reconciliation. And this is called integration. It consists just in exercising nonviolent virtue in dialogue to find ways of combining the energy of all partners. It continues the public dialogues. Participants compare and contrast values and assumptions of their conflicting views to search for shared or analogous aspects within them that can provide kind of initial intermediate steps, common ground and agreement. These di dialogues themselves generate a kind of mutual understanding or the ways different and situated participants experience the injustice at issue. In the course of participation, the contestants are slowly transformed into partners in nonviolent relationships of working together, contesting together, breaking off negotiations, starting again, and so on, and creating ways of living together that they couldn't even imagine beforehand. 
negotiations is not actually a specific uncoerced agreement. Because this is always imperfect and always open to nonviolent contestation in the future. Rather, in working towards agreement, they learn to acquire the virtues and arts of combining their energies and working with and for each other. In so doing, they bring into being an intersubjective nonviolent practices of contestation and conciliation, bring them into being again without subordination. So human conflicts never end for this tradition, but humans can actually learn nonviolent ways of enacting, addressing, and resolving them as they learn the broader nonviolent way of life in which integration has a place. Now, I'll just, I want to mention one more part of this and then I'll stop. And that, that's the process of social change itself and how it's understood in this tradition. A lot of misunderstanding doesn't work immediately and so on. So it must be false. And Greg argues that large scale nonviolent conversion and social change does not occur in fast time. And rather, the process, he says, is slow but sure. It is sure because each step of the means embodies and carries forward the end. Peace by peaceful means, democracy by democratic means. It is also immediate in the specific sense that each step in ethics, in constructive programs, in voluntary simplicity, and in agonistics involves withdrawing our capacities from the violent and dominative systems at hand and exercising them in contrast in nonviolent and non-dominative communities of practice. This is the so-called double movement of, of the Gandhian tradition I mentioned earlier. The processes of social change by persuasion rather than by force are also long-term, and Gandhi and Greg talk of 100 to 150 years of consistent doing this to cause uh, large cumulative effects of these virtuous steps and cycles gradually reach local tipping points that outgrow the declining violent and dominative system. This process of change is said to be analogous to processes of ecological secession in the life sciences. So, short, very brief conclusion and then I'll stop. What light can this integral nonviolent tradition throw on nonviolence today? There's been a, since Gandhi and King, there's been a very impressive growth in the main branches of nonviolence over the last hundred years. There's also a global network, or global, plural, global networks of research and teaching on nonviolent constructive programs, campaigns, and reconciliation around the world through the reconciliation commissions and so on. However, these experiments have not been transformative of the global systems of violence, domination, exploitation, inequality, and ecological destruction. The major reason for this is the disintegration of the ethical trunk and the branches of the nonviolent banyan tree into quite separate practices, campaigns, movements, community-based self-government, co-ops, networks, and so on. Many of these also employ the veiled violence of enmity and power over. They remain alienated from the ethical and ecological ground of integral nonviolent power with. And this disintegration stems from a failure to understand the process of social change itself. This process just is the slow but sure, step-by-step, -step integrated nonviolent way of life. If this is true, the way out of this disintegration and disempowerment is to exercise one's inner freedom and ethical steps of self-transformation with others in coordinated voluntary simplicity, constructive programs, and nonviolent agonistics. These exemplary steps reconnect participants and observers with the integral power of nonviolence, the only power that can grow to become greater than and transformative of the power of violence and domination. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it was wonderful. Uh, apart from being poor, it was, it was wonderfully clear and uh, uh, went eloquent. And, uh, thank you. We have about 15, 20 minutes um, for questions. Um, while people are gathering their thoughts, uh, I'll just kick off the discussion with one myself. We have a number of law students here, of course, this is hosted by a law school. I wonder if I could ask perhaps a naive question, but um, 
something about law that makes it inherently power over uh, practice. Um, uh, I'm thinking, for example, here, uh, you know, such, such that the only kind of work we can do is work to transform it into having more of a of, of, of power with elements. Um, is, it, is it, though, something that's inherently a, a power over system? I'm thinking, for example, of the work of Robert Cover, um, who talks about um, how legal interpretation occurs in the field of pain and death, there's an almost inherent, an inherently built violence into legal practice or legal interpretation, although the way that occurs is often in a very calm, everyday, uh, ostensibly at least calm, everyday, um, uh, normal operation of law. It's just violent. say that he, he thinks that uh, uh, legal practice can have juris generative rather than juris empathic, as he says, elements, which brings me to a, to, to, to a kind of secondary question. So the first one is, is law inherently a power over? The second is, does what Cover say about law having both of these aspects mean that actually no practice is inherently violent or non-violent, so that all practices, all practices have elements of both? Yeah. Well, I'll answer the second one first, because both Candy and Greg would agree with that. There's this potential in humans to go one way or the other, or any relationship. This, I could get terribly upset by a question in the background trust and security I have in asking it. I could strike back in a, a way we're familiar with, right? So this, this disposition to dura grow, to violence in our attitudes and to happen in all human relations, but we all also have this other seed non-retaliation in that way, taking the ball, collecting ourselves, however we want to describe that, mindfulness, so on and so on. So we have both those dispositions as humans, and what the, this tradition is, uh, is banking on is that we can cultivate that side of humanity. I realize, according to Mishra, we live in 200 years of the age of anger and so on. Try to think of Martha Nussbaum's book, Anger and Forget Guilt, and yeah, that's true, that's a that's why we're in this terrible state right now. Uh, but here are the practices uh, of the self and the kind of programs that we could begin to cultivate this other ethos and show it's a more attractive and more effective al alternative. And I think I would say that, it, again, and Greg would both say that, and so would Martin Luther King. So we're all on side with those three there, and Barbara. I, th I also think it's right to say there are movements within the law that are trying to move the law in that direction, that we can have law without uh, backed up by force or, or violence, and things debated in the history of law. Is it a law if it doesn't have a coercive punishment mechanism? And the whole of restorative justice is to say, yes, it better. We better have that alternative because the punitive version lock her up, the predator, lock them up, and so on. It doesn't, isn't solving these problems. It's just creating the biggest prison system in the world in North America. So we have to be able to think of a way of law that brings people around to restore or transformative justice or restorative justice, reconciliatory justice. And how does that work? And I think there are a number of movements on the planet today moving in that direction. One that I think is really important in every one of room is familiar with it, it's what might be called the democratization of law. Remember the famous debate in 1990, Habermas and Rawls agreed that democracy and the rule of law had to be equi primordial, and that's to say we can't have a master imposing a law and then just democratic practice within it. We who are subject to any legal regime have to see ourselves in some sense as the co-authors of it or we'll vote for Brexit, right? We'll see it as an imposed from others. And Richard Bellamy has a nice book just out <laughs> this week on this kind of democratic disconnect we have. And so what's now called democratic constitutionalism rather than constitutional democracy is the argument that all the way down our legal orders ought to pass through democratic practices of will formation and either agreement or disagreement uh, with the body of law, even if it's there. I mean, I don't think in any university I know of today, if you wanted to establish an 
equity program for differently gendered human beings and so on, if the people themselves, the students themselves, didn't have a say in that, it wouldn't matter how perfect it was in the Isaiah Berlin sense, have some bright people running the place, right? Uh, it would be just not accepted anymore. We really have moved to that view that that law has normative bindingness on me just insofar as I see myself participating in discussions about it, reforming it or building it in the first place. And that's a huge sea change. I think it began in administrative law first in the 1970s and then in equity policies and now in constitutionalism. A scholar of mine just published a book uh, at University of Victoria Law School, Jeremy Weber, just published a book on what he calls agonistic constitutionalism. And, the, and it, so you can see that structure of argument. The second one is, is just the growth of legal pluralism. So a kind of dialing back from the idea that the, the state legal system is the only legal system and that uh, everyone else is subordinate to it, to the view that people in their own communities of practice develop their own normativity that they can work with. And I, I take the work of Hugo Matti at the University of Turin and working on what he calls commoning and so on, just people getting together and building up a body of normative ways of acting together and say, asking the state power to say, it's a bit like the pluralists of the 1920s and 30s, they just back off. We, we have a, a legal order here that we, we're bound to. We can justify it to you in broad terms, in meta norms that we all agree on, but it's quite distinctive. And so that legal pluralism, I think, is a way of people say, of again taking the law into their own democratic hands. If you see what I mean, being bound by the rule of law, but also saying we can change it in these nonviolent democratic ways. Another thing that I probably people who work in this area don't see it as optimistically as I do. But the proliferation of truth and reconciliation commissions, which, I mean, often those are drawn directly from Gandhi or King. So people come forward who have been violently abused, and they speak truth to the most powerful people face to face, right? That speaking truth to power, how, just how important that is. And then this painful process then of reconciliation, of actually sitting down with the perpetrator, not just throwing them in jail or shooting them or whatever, but trying to work through this, treating the, the violent offender as a human being who has a capacity to change. <coughs> that, again, worked with the truth and re reconciliations with ind indigenous people in Canada, and it's painful work, but it's very powerful when you go through this. And Martin Luther King's last book called, um, Where Do We Go From Here? Just before he was assassinated. And he said, it's either community or it's chaos. And by community, he meant this term, integration. And <clears throat> so he didn't mean he was assimilating to white America. What he meant was we cr create a community together through these kinds of practices. And again, there are lots of examples of that going on. So there are movements of this kind that I think are moving in the direction of suspending violence and domination because once you have that, look at the degree of inequality and the violence and domination of the relationships between the global north and the south, within the global north now. It's just horrendous, in my opinion. Well, it's obviously not Steven Pinker's view <laughs> of the present, but, uh, um, and, these sorts of practices, and I could mention more, are, for me, signs of positive change. Thank you so much. It's really helpful. I've opened it up for questions from the audience. Yes, please. Um, thank you for, for the talk. It was fascinating. And my question kind of flows from Max's question, right? Because uh, I believe any answer 
facilitates uh, intention to injure someone else. And what I have in mind is because you yourself mentioned some uh, some non-violent movements like the Black Lives Matter and uh, and the Occupy could fall into that direction. And some of their actions, depending on the definition we give, could be considered as violent or non-violent. So if, uh, for instance, a group of activists they close down a the street, they violate the right of others to free movement, is that action violent? Or if protesters, you know, they hurl um, teddy bears and stuffed animals at police, is that violent or not? Right. So it, I, I believe your answer to Max's question about whether law is actually always violent depends on how you actually define violence. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for that. And, and now here's the definition of violence. Um, yeah. So by 1944, there was a book published uh, by Thomas Paulin. There, uh, already there were non, nine senses of violence and nonviolence. So this is a radically family resemblance concept. Eh? Like Nietzsche says, it doesn't have a definition, it has a history. And it's our work as historians and genealogists to say what's the history of this distinction between violence and nonviolence. And a self reflective nonviolent tradition, part of the ethos of nonviolence is always raising this question, what's the best definition of nonviolence and of violence that we have today, given our history? Just like we do the same thing with liberty, we say, okay, here's the dominant view of liberty, and then we do a little genealogy and say, oh, there's another kind of liberty before liberalism, and we put it to, our, to an audience and say, think about this other way of thinking about liberty, Let's see how it changes the way we think about liberty. And this has been a, a lesson that Quentin Skinner has taught me over now 40 years, I think. Yeah. And we have to do that not to say, oh, I've got the definition, but again, if I can put it in this way, put that question as something we, we are beings who reflect on, is this violent or nonviolent? Having said that, I'm very impressed by Gandhi's definition of violence and nonviolence, that it begins in this this, these basic attitudes of fear and anger and propulsion. The movement struck, strikes me that, that in some sense that they see that as the root of violence and domi dom domination. And then you see other traditions, they have that same view. Christians believe, love your enemy. Don't retaliate immediately. Right. They may not practice it. And they, as Greg said, uh, yeah, well, Christ said it 1,900 years ago, but he died young. <laughs> so he didn't have time to tell us how to actually practice that, to respond with love, and love being nonviolence. And he said, but then along came Gandhi, who lived longer. Right? Famous book by Alfred North Whitehead in 1933 that just draws the family yeah, so I think that's a very powerful distinction. And for us today, it's in North America, it's very important. Because what happens after uh, <coughs> Gandhi, then Martin Luther King, uh, Robert Kennedy are assassinated, uh, Malcolm X says, no, I'm now in favor of nonviolence, and his former supporters then assassinate him two weeks later. In the late 60s, a turn to violence and away from nonviolence. And then a new kind of nonviolence develops. 1973, Gene Sharp writes a very famous three volume book on nonviolence. He says, forget all this stuff about uh, a moral dimension to nonviolence or ethics, like I Andy Gray called the ethics. No, we don't need it. Nonviolence is just a technique that can be effective in overthrowing rulers and will gain power over them and will exercise power in these governments and so on. And that becomes this pragmatic tradition of nonviolence, which becomes <coughs> dominant. It does, it's not dominant in Black Lives Matter. There's a division within Black. If you read, read uh, uh, the Broom's genealogy of it, very nice argument that it falls on the King side of things, not on the Gene Sharp side. So we have these two, three ways of thinking about violence and nonviolence today. One, the Gandhi Greg one, which I tried to 
the second, the pragmatic or instrumental tradition of gene chart, very powerful tradition. And then thirdly, another third tradition that we have to remember that nonviolent means resist not evil at all. Pacifism. That you don't engage in evil, but even to engage in a form of resistance is itself a kind of coercion, therefore, in some strands of Quakerism and so on. But for that kind of nonviolence, just uh, resist not evil. So I think we have around the world those three very different ways of thinking about nonviolence, and then they break down. Kurt Schock's new book, Nonviolent um, Civil Resistance, 2016, goes through all the dominant modern ones, but they really fall into those three general categories. And I think we should treat our a nonviolent tradition like any scientific <coughs> tradition, that it constantly reflects on its own presuppositions. It may run along on the gene chart one for a while. We have three in the empirical nonviolent uh, studies. We have now 300 examples of nonviolent campaigns over the last 100 years that we can study. Right? One way of looking at them is to say 80% of those nonviolent resistant movements were successful or moderately successful. Then you look how many of them cared about whether the anger was mobilized or not. In most cases, anger played a role. Uh, and often, Gandhi's commitment to the rule of law, that when you break the law in order to expose its injustice, you also willingly go to prison and <coughs> suffer the punishment. Whereas the Gene Sharp tradition, why would you do that? Right? But the Gandhian tradition looks at the instrumental tradition in the following ways. Well, what are the long-term excesses, the successes? How better off now are we because of the Arab Spring? Is it Egypt? Egypt a less violent society than it was in 2011. Could the, uh, the Gandhian tradition in Egypt, if it did have a, a different say in it, would the non-violent movement be uh, different in some way? So it seems to me you just are very honest that this is a work in process. It's a, a set of hypotheses three traditions about what violence is not. And we test them every day. That's why Gandhi, the subtitle of his autobiography in 1926 is Experiments with Truth. He said, these are all hypotheses. I test them every time I have a campaign. Good to follow up a bit on, on definition, uh, one of the central concepts somebody do something that that person does not want to do. So in the limit, it doesn't really matter if you talk about power over or power with, power with in, in economics, which is usually about either collusion, which in a normative sense is bad, or cooperation, which in a normative sense, normative sense often is good. So is, is your concept of power the same as, as I have, or is it different in some way? Yeah, I'm, well, thank you for that question. I, I'm actually a, quite a hard line around that one. I think the definition you gave of power is always, in some sense, power over. In, that's, the, that's the concept of power that this tradition is challenging, that that doesn't exist, exhaust the field of power, right? Power with is really something different in kind. The only kind of power exercised in power with is persuasion. That's the contrast. Again, Gregor looking around, what's a synonym 
uh, and they come up with the concept of persuasion. That has all sorts of problems. But, yeah. but power with, in the limit, has to be exercised in order to be power sure. on somebody else, right? No, it's, no that's, that's one of the distinctions. Power with is us acting in concept, in concert, over a good we share, or we've decided it's worth sustaining. Say we're fighting Heathrow Three, since I was engaged with these people that were uh, justifying it. Uh, we get together. How are we going to mobilize to exercise that power? We do it with each other, for each other, in a sustainable way. We're not exercising power over anybody. We're trying to persuade others outside of. But we treat them as if, as if they're already in. Then how could they be power? Pardon? How could they be power? Well, it can be. You're never exercising it sure. over somebody, Here. right? No, you're exercising. You're, you're exercising power with each other. It's it, that's exactly right. That's not power, it seems to me. I, I well, okay, so I. Let me try. Not making somebody do something that that person or group of individuals don't want to do. That's right. Well, but you have power you, to leave this room if you want to. <laughs> but you have power to leave the room if you want to. But that's not going to be against your child. That's an expression of your child. But it's a power. Right. Right. But that's a power. It's a. I could watch you do it. <laughs> oh sure. Yeah. But that but contradicts what you just said. Does it? The athlete has to be power. No, no, something that, that happened that right. not no, in the that. But once you have power over, then that doesn't apply, right? I can leave the room, but I don't I don't have power over anybody else. I use my own free will to But then the that shows us that power to do something isn't always power to cause something to happen against someone's desires. It might be an expression of Power with or power over is neither. It's power over yourself. It's the question of the power that you have. Well, right, that's the same as freedom. Sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lost okay. But yeah, but that can happen. Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. But it's another. It, it's another. But it's part of the puzzle. Yeah. But another part is is a, just a historical one. The. The introduction of this distinction, power over and power with, is presented really clearly, I think, for the first time by Mary Parker Falk in 1924 in a great book called Creative Experience, that a form of power comes into being only when we are reasoning together like we are here. And we not that reasoning together also evolves into acting together. That's what she means by power and with. That's it, it's an intersubjective form of power that presupposes this relational ontology, this being with or knits in existential. And it's a form of power we don't see when we're always thinking of power over. The classic development of the view is with Hannah Arendt. What she says was this whole history of power over, that's been the dominant way of thinking about power in the West, isn't really power at all. You get this mo modeled on force, modeled on uh, struggles for existence, that who gets power over another. And that, like Mary Wollstonecraft says, that's the basic problem in modernity. We think we're equal, but it's a contest of power over, and men dominate. Arendt says, I won't even call power over power. Right? So I want to call all those forms of power modalities of force. I want to talk about power as an in intersubjective, something that actually comes into being when we cooperate and contest together, wasn't there before. That's what this tradition is trying to talk about. That's why Greg says it's like connecting to electricity or learning to swim. It's a kind of buoyancy that we have when we sit in discussions like this and listen 
each other's questions and answers. And the, the only kind of leadership is the exemplarity of the person who's presenting an argument. I mean, it really is Aristotle's three dimensions of rhetoric, three types of, three things we look for in a persuasive argument, the ethos of the speaker, then what they appeal to, notice is that this distinction is now widely used, power over power with all the activists that come and study at University of Victoria, whether from Latin America, they call it horizontality, if they come from Spain and so on, or the global south of the EU and the fight in Syria. What they talk about is their capacity to occupy public squares. It's not how does that affect others, but what kind of mode of being of acting together does that bring into being? in those communities of practice. And that's quite distinctive. It can do without power over. And I, and I think, I disagree, I agree with you that in the Western tradition, it's very hard to find examples of power with. Mary Parker Follett is not the first. Kropotkin in mutual aid is 1901. But he doesn't actually use these terms. A long way of saying, I really do think there's something, uh, or I wouldn't have given this lecture, in power with that makes it distinction, the intersubjective quality of it, and the fact that it's not exercised over others. Gandhi, when he, when he, after the salt march, when he tried to, uh, he wanted Indians to uh, make their own textiles, right, and for their own clothing, and he knew to put the Lanc Lancashire went to England and said, look, I'm sorry we're, we're doing that, but that imperial economic relation was oppressive for us, and we're freeing ourselves from it, but making our own cloth ourselves here in India, the Kata movement. Uh, and I'm sorry if you're losing a job, but that job you had was unjust, not our, the imperial relation was unjust, not us. Uh, stopping to buy your product, just like today, when we protest a multinational corporation who's creating an injustice, we withdraw our support from it and we look for local alternatives. Can we develop whatever that is, that social power, whatever, and locally or the food locally? If you put multinational corporations out of business, and you might say, well, we're exercising power over them, but in fact, what you're doing is simply in a sense, you're withdrawing your human capabilities from exercising them in those institutions because they're unjust, and you're exercising it in another way, in the Chipko movement in northern India or whatever. So it, I, I want to hang on to the distinction that we really are 